Mr. Pisani Ferry, thank you very much for joining us here at the Fung Global Institute. Let's talk first about the macro level internationalization of a currency. What would you say a country needs to do in order to internationalize it properly in a measured way and without risk? I think we've, we've learned uh, quite a lot in this uh, crisis about you know what uh, it implies to become an international currency. I would uh, I would start from the, the experience of with the, with the euro. I mean because the the view initially was that the euro would become an international currency if the market so wishes, without uh, you know authorities taking any stance. So the the, the, the motto was neither encourage nor nor discourage. So you know, let the market decide. Um, and the market actually decided that the euro was a sort of a good second international currency with uh, you know, a share in the bond issuance, uh, a share of reserves, a share of uh, a small share I mean, at regional level as, a, as an anchor currency for, for countries pegging the exchange rate to the, to the euro. And it looked like you know, there were regular reports uh, with the Europeans congratulating themselves on the success of the of the, of the euro as an international currency, um, but in quiet times it's it's relatively easy because you know nothing is being tested. Uh, the problem comes when 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 challenging times uh, arrive, and uh, at uh, at that time uh, you see that it requires much more. I mean, you know, suddenly capital flows out of countries having pegged their currency to your your currency. And you have to decide whether you are going to ex extend liquidity swap lines to central banks across border. But that requires having a mandate to do so, being uh, you know, willing to take the risk, being uh, supported by a treasury, and all that was missing in the case of, of the euro. So when, when Central and Eastern Europe, when countries in Central and Eastern Europe were f found themselves in, in difficulty, we, we, we feared the fact that precisely there was no official stand, there was no, there was no decision uh, really to internationalize the currency. And therefore the ECB had no mandate. So the ECB uh, had some repo agreements, but it was not able really to take the risk. Uh, you know, all the risk that would uh, have uh, been taken normally. Uh, to, 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 to provide liquidity to, to, to those countries. There was uh, some arrangements with the Swedish Central Bank, etc. So, so that you know, some, some assistance was brought. There was an initiative uh, fostered by the, uh, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development uh, also to, to, to convince banks to roll over. Um, and in the end, so things did not, um, you know, there was no, there was no disaster. Things, things went uh, pretty well. But I think I take it as a demonstration that it's, it's, a, it's a very strong commitment to internationalize your currency because it means that you have responsibilities across border. And um, the, you can see what the US did uh, at the time when the, there was a, a shortage of dollar liquidity when, when banks operating in, in US dollars could not finance themselves on the, on the market. The, the, the Federal Reserve extended swap lines to a number of other central banks. It limited swap lines with uh, the European Central Bank, with the Bank of England, with the Bank of Japan, and with the Swiss National Banks, so that they could provide unlimited, unlimited um, dollar liquidity to banks operating in their um, um, region. Um, but that's a very, that's a very strong risk that, in, in fact, the, the Federal Reserve took, and it could only take this risk because it was backed by the, the U.S. Treasury. So there was a sort of, you know, official. A line. And actually, uh, not every central bank was treated uh, in the same way. I mean, there are there 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 were political decisions involved in the in the the, the degree to which uh, liquidity was extended to those uh, central banks. So so in fact, you, you you see that you know in crisis times there is another dimension that uh, is revealed that is somehow not visible in normal times. Um, and um, I think that's a lesson for for everyone. In the case of China, for example, um, China is obviously looking very closely at internationalization of its RMB. You mentioned responsibility there, which is something that is um, very interesting because it's not just about attracting capital inflow and it's not just about sort of guarding against hot money, but it's also about responsibility to the international community. 
when a country does take that bold move. Could you say a bit more about that? Well, I mean, the, the, if you mean by internationalization, uh, so, sort of developing an offshore market and as a you know, step towards uh, liberalizing your, your, your financial account and uh, you know, gradually moving in a very Chinese way uh, towards an opening of the financial account, that doesn't mean taking huge uh, external responsibility. Now, if you mean by that internationalization that your currency becomes one of the major currencies that is being used uh, widely externally, that is being used as an anchor for other countries pegging the exchange rate uh, on your on your on your your currency, uh, all that means at some point that you are really taking uh, real responsibility vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, the countries, vis-à-vis uh, -vis the, the the private agents that are that are using this this currency, and if you don't deliver on this this responsibility, then at some point you're you're going to face you know a um, major difficulty. So I I don't think it's an immediate. Uh, uh, commitment. But eventually, if you go all the way, it becomes a, a real commitment. I mean, of course, if uh, China, which is, you know, aiming to be a, a global leader in, in so many levels, that is one of the things that it is looking uh, closely at, um, you know, in order to kind of retain its position at the world's, um, you know, second largest economy and maybe overtake the US in a few mm -hmm. years. Um, that is something that it is talking about at length, but what, can you, what could you say that um, from the Eurozone, the lessons learned from the Eurozone, has it been taking a step back in recent times, in, in the last sort of couple of years, as a result of what's been going on in the Eurozone? Um, in terms of the, the external use of the euro, I mean, we, we've, we've seen some, some decline. I mean, nothing you know, extraordinary, but a few percentage points, I mean, on the, across the, the range of indicators. Um, which is also, you know, an indication of the, 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 qu the questioning there is of the, the strength of the, the eurozone, and you know, this this crisis the eurozone is going through. That's sort of normal. Um, whether uh, the the eurozone can continue, um, I mean, assuming the internal problems are, are, are solved, uh, whether at some point it needs to take a clear stance with the internationalization, I think so. I think you know this this is stands that I, I summarized by saying that neither encourage nor discourage is not something that you can, you can uh, stick to uh, you know, permanently. I mean, at some point, your partners need to know what, what is your stance. And I think that would apply for, for to, to, to everyone, including, including China. Um, uh, as regards uh, the, the lesson for, for, for China and the role of the renminbi in the world economy, I think it would be highly desirable uh, that uh, that uh, the renminbi becomes uh, a major international uh, currency. Uh, you know, they are, the question is whether the, the, the geography of currency corresponds to the state of the global economy or, or, or not. I think a situation in which we would have one international currency whose economic base would become relatively narrow compared to the, the scope of the currency would be a relatively dangerous situation. Because in this type of situation, there would be a disconnect between the, let's say, let's put it in very simple terms, the fiscal capacity that underpins this currency uh, and, and the role of the currency. Uh, take the, you know, just as a thought experiment, assume that you have a situation where the, the, the US economy has become, you know, a significantly smaller share of the world economy than it is now assume that it remains the only international currency and assume that you, you find yourself in a situation like the one we found uh, ourselves in, in in 2008, where suddenly, I mean, you have to provide liquidity to re the rest of, of the world. I mean, there's a major fiscal risk. And what would underpin that is the fiscal capacity of the US federal government. And the US federal government, at the end of the day, would, has a limited fiscal, fiscal capacity. So I think it's much better if we move to a situation where there is more balance between the, the different uh, currency, probably the US dollar remaining the main international currency for a long time, but it's not the, the only one, but there are several uh, international currencies, which raises all sorts of questions about cooperation, about you know, uh, the, the relationship between those currencies, which are new uh, uh, issues uh, compared at least to the last 50 or, 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 or 70 years. You mentioned just now that it would be highly desirable if China moves further down the path to internationalization. Why do you say that? 
Because I think, you know, if you look at any sort of uh, projection, uh, we know those projections are no, not 100% reliable, but they tell us something. For example, the OECD projection tells us that uh, the China will represent 40% uh, of world savings. This is huge. Uh, uh, you know, this is, this, I mean, you know, not any other country, obviously, will represent 40% of, of world savings. Uh, so I think in this kind of situation, uh, there needs to be, again, some sort of correspondence between the uh, distribution of, of savings, the distribution of economic uh, power, and the, the distribution of, of monetary roles. Let's turn back to the Eurozone, if you don't mind, as well. Um, obviously, we've had uh, the banking crisis going on in Cyprus at the moment. What other vulnerabilities, what other kind of risks do you think the Eurozone is exposed to at the moment? Because, I mean, for, for, lay, for lay people like me, not experts like you, but, you know, Cyprus came a little out of the blue. What other risks are there? I mean, people are watching very closely around the world at, at sure. this situation. We have a, a very difficult adjustment going on between Northern Europe and Southern Europe. That's a, that's a macro adjustment. Uh, that, you know, the, the, that the result of the, all the imbalances that accumulated uh, in the first decade of the euro uh, with uh, low real interest rates creating all sorts of real estate booms, credit booms in Southern Europe. At the same time, Northern Europe, especially Germany, was going the opposite uh, way, uh, was struggling to reestablish competitiveness and, uh, you know, with a lot of wage moderation, low credit, etc. So this adjustment is taking place. It is taking place painfully. It is taking place relatively slowly. Um, and, um, and it is far from, from over. I mean, we've seen part of it happening. For example, wages uh, in Southern Europe are adjusting. We have seen, we're seeing more problems with prices, that are, there's mo much more price rigidity than wage rigidity. So this, this rebalancing, current account uh, deficits are, are shrinking, have, have actually shrunk, and you know, some countries have reached current account balance. But domestic demand has, has collapsed, so the counterpart of this uh, current account adjustment is in part the collapse in domestic demand. In part, this is also the increase in export. I mean, a country like Spain, for example, is doing quite well in terms of export. So it is a very difficult macro adjustment, a very painful macro adjustment that's taking time, that's not over. And the question uh, is you know, how, um, how societies are, are, are responding to this situation. Um, what we have seen emerging in recent time is more the political risk. I mean, the, the story of the first two or three years of the Euro crisis was sort of markets and governance, and citizens were not part of the game. Um, now citizens are becoming more part of the game. Um, we, you, you, you see that uh, you know, the, the, there is fatigue with the, with the adjustment. Uh, Italy, the Italian election, have shown uh, that you know, at some point the citizens they, they resent this 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 type of situation. S Cyprus also has, uh, with the rejection by Parliament of the deal that was reached uh, between the governments in uh, in Brussels, um, has shown also that citizens are part of the game. So I think it's becoming a more complicated, a more uh, you know, an uncertain game in which you have. You have three parts. I mean, you have the citizens, you have the markets, you have the governments. Markets are relatively quiet, have been relatively quiet, but citizens have waken up, and uh, and so that that's the game we're in. Now, the lesson from the first few years is that in each and every country where citizens were asked, you know, do you want? I mean, I had the opportunity not only to give it to opinion polls, but really in in in, in elections. Uh, to decide whether they want to, to, to bring to powers parties that are in favor of leaving the euro or not, they have chosen to remain in the euro area. Um, that was uh, even the case in, in Greece, even though there's, I mean, there's, there is now a coalition, but clearly this coalition has made the choice of, of remaining. This is, was the case in Spain. Um, this has been the case you know, more or less everywhere. So I think uh, this adjustment is very painful. Um, there's a, a lot of resentment, but at the same time, no country and no, you know, no, no, I mean, the people have made the choice of saying, let's, let's 
try something else. Let, let's get out of it. I think the, the, the strong feeling is that the adjustment within is painful, but the, the adjustment outside would be even more uh, difficult and, and, and perhaps I mean, the financially um, would be more costly than doing the adjustment inside. And that remains true. So my, my bet would still be that uh, you know, it's going to be long, painful, difficult, but it, it is going to happen within the euro area. Let me round off then by drawing on what you just said about political uncertainty. Let me ask you a big picture question then about the original soul of the European Union, about peace, about cohesion. The crisis has exposed some of the decisions with you know, Germany being seen by some as the strong arm of Europe. Mm -hmm. Do you fear for the original philosophy of the European Union with what's going on right now? I think the, uh, the tension there is, is, is real. Um, Somehow, uh, people in Northern Europe, and especially in Germany, have perceived this crisis as being driven by uh, countries in which uh, people did not adjust, did not, did not uh, save, uh, you know, did not reform. Um, and when the, the problem came, uh, they just wanted to get support and transfers. Uh, I think this is a partial representation of the of the, the facts, to say the least. It's true that some countries did not reform at all. But it's not true, for example, that in a country like Spain, uh, I mean, they had a very uh, sound fiscal policy. They had a very low debt. Uh, you know, they went through a credit boom. I mean, so many countries were through, went through credit booms. I mean, it's not a privilege of Southern Europe. It's not a privilege of any, any, any country. I mean, you know, banking crises happen everywhere. So it's a sort of misrepresentation that it's all about, you know, not not doing the right thing and uh, not reforming and, and being fiscally ir irresponsible. But um, uh, so there, there is now this tension with the, the South saying, you know, they don't understand what uh, Spain, for example, they don't understand the northern the northern don't understand what happened to us. They don't understand that you know uh, it's not that we were guilty of all the, 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 you know, the things that they are, they are pretending we are uh, guilty of. And people in the North saying, you know, they want to um, actually um, you know, be, be rescued by our, our savings. So it is a, it is a difficult, uh, I mean, in, in the situation and this spirit, this European spirit in the, <laughs> in the process is, um, you know, is, is being seriously challenged. I mean, the, we, 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 we're seeing that and we're seeing the, the appetite for, for, for cooperation, the sense of common purpose uh, being strongly diminished. Now what remains is sort of the sense of survival. Um, that uh, the pattern is that at the end of the day, whenever there's a choice to make, at the end of the day, the choice that is, is, is made is a choice of, of, of hanging together and trying to find a solution. But without uh, without the spirit of you know moving forward, and we, you you could see that in the the banking union, banking union was decided in June as a response to the you know, acute crisis situation. Um, it was a bold move. It is a bold move. It is being implemented, but there has been also some some backtracking as soon as the situation has started to improve as a as a consequence of this decision to move to banking union and also of the decision by the ECB. Um, the um, the, the, the situation, uh, the market situation has improved uh, significantly and then there has been some, some backtracking. So there is this, this, this race, this game, uh, you know, where uh, clearly there is, this, there is a will to, to survive, but it doesn't go as far as uh, translating into a will to do uh, something uh, willingly new, new together. And that's, that's, uh, that's the tension there is at present. Mr. John Pisani-Ferry, Director of Bruegel, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you.